guys, we're in the middle of a pandemic and these are trying times. It's hard on our mental health, our mental state. And this is why I love our sponsor today, BetterHelp. They're the largest online counseling platform worldwide. They change the way people get help with facing life's challenges by providing convenient, discreet, affordable access to licensed therapists. BetterHelp makes professional counseling available anytime, anywhere, through a computer, tablet, or smartphone. It's brilliant. Sign up today. Go to betterhelp.com backslash solving healthcare and get 10% off sign up fees. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Kwadru Karamante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. All right, I think we could get started, guys. So, welcome everybody to our latest live cast, Quadcast Nation. Thanks for joining us. This is something that um, I'm going to say means a lot to me and our team because, um, you know, we've in Ontario have seen a lot of um, steps to try and mitigate the risk of a progression of co- of COVID nineteen, and there's been some descending opinions and um, and you know, what I always I'm a big proponent of is what can we do about it? If you aren't happy with what's going on, propose something that's a, a more uh, viable solution. And that's what we're going to do today, people. We're going to have to, by the end of this day, we're going to really talk about the steps forward, what we think will get Canadians, Ontarians through this pandemic. And so before uh, we start, I want to give a little bit of a shout out to Julia, who's going to be helping us screen our questions. She is our like all star uh, producer, social media master. So thank you for helping us out today. Uh, She's also got an amazing website, a spoonful of science that gives you nutritional advice, evidence based nutritional advice. So it's all proper. Um, and um, so thank you, Julia. So when you guys have questions, you could put them in either the chat box on Facebook, that are, those that are watching live, or you could put them, uh, those that are uh, with us on the webinar uh, link, you could put them in the chat box or the Q&A, and she will, uh, she will screen them and, and we'll address them approximately 60 minutes from now. All right. Let, the second let, thing I will mention is those that are going to want the video version of this email directly to them and the podcast when it's all done just on facebook you could put in news n-e-w-s and you'll be able to get that direct directly mailed to you when this is ready so um thanks for that and it also prompts you to subscribe to the show which by now come on guys you gotta jump on that train come on um so thank you for that um so let me let me introduce the panelists, or actually, we will uh, collectively introduce the uh, panelists. So Heidi, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh, really great to be here and join you from the West Coast. So I'm Heidi Tvorek. I'm an associate professor of history and public policy at UBC. So I work on uh, the history and contemporary policy around communications, particularly health communications. And I've been working on COVID pretty much since the beginning um, and did a big report back in September looking at how nine countries on five continents communicates around COVID, what are the best practices we can learn, including Canada, and then comparing BC and Ontario. So the good news is there's lots we can learn from other countries about how to do this better. Love it. And guys, uh, by the way, we did, we did an episode uh, a few weeks back, which was one of my favorite. It was nice, compact, full of gems, and we'll talk about some of that content today. All right, next, I got Zane. Zane, you want to throw down, please? Yeah. Hi, everyone. So I'm Zane Chagla. I'm an associate professor at McMaster University. I'm an infectious disease physician. My full-time job is infectious diseases and infection control. Uh, But I've done policy around things like personal protective equipment. I've been involved in clinical trials in COVID from personal protective equipment to medical therapies, uh, you know, serology and and other uh, other interventions. I have a lot of hats uh, around the table and I think I've, I've also uh, done a, a little bit of work globally in terms of some uh, planning in a, in a couple of rural institutions outside of Canada 
and uh, and a lot of media around COVID nineteen, trying to be a communicator to to the population, which has been a, the, probably the funnest part of all of this. Oh man, Zane has been hustling. I was saying, Ian, <laughs> Ian Hannah men saying, if you're seeing this, which you will, I think he's your number one fan, my friend. <laughs> all right. Uh, last but not least, Steph. Yeah, thanks very much. So I'm, I'm a, a, my name is Seth Burrell. I'm a population health physician and also a, a family doc. And I mean, so I'm, a, I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins in, in the U.S. and normally kind of bounce back and forth and providing clinical care and homeless shelters here for many years. But normally my public health work was all there when, you know, the, the outbreak started and the epidemic started in Toronto. We set up a homeless uh, shelter isolation site on March 14th and have been doing population health, um, you know, in the shelters in terms of outbreak mitigation and, and uh, when now that increasing outbreaks are happening and, and also, um, you know, now setting up vaccination as we're moving into vaccination within the shelter settings. I've done less media that has always been, I feel people who look like me and, and sound like me are overrepresented in the media as is. And so I've always been happy for others to do media, but here I am in COVID uh, doing more of it. Uh, so, you know, that is what it is. So. I, I actually think you need to be doing more, my friend, especially after our, we did a, a show on, um, you know, uh, almost two months ago, I think. Uh, and uh, it was one of our most popular ones. So uh, thank you so, agree, for agreeing to do this. And once again, I'm just going to reinforce before we get started. This is communication expert. We got infectious disease. We got public health and we got, you know, critical care frontline staff that uh, have been at the forefront of this from the get-go. So keep that in mind when, we're, when we start throwing down. So I'm going to start with Steph, actually. Um, you know, we've had a lot of inter, uh, talks about where, for example, Ontario or the country has gone wrong. But where would you say we need to be focusing on? Like, where would be your priority focus at this time? Like, if you had the ear of the premier or whoever's uh, in charge at this point, what, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the sort of overarching themes of what I would like to do is is a return to sort of basic principles in uh, Canadian public health. And, you know, those three principles, and I think a lot of what I'll say is actually uh, laid out in the first SARS report. And in some ways, I'll just say it's, it's a fantastic report. Maybe you can share it uh, via the media. Obviously, it's freely available. And it was basic, you know, it was a report that was developed by a pan-Canadian group in 2004, that laid the groundwork for the, you know, the development of FAC, the Public Health Agency Canada and Ontario, specifically what was the Ontario Agency for Health Protection and Promotion and now Public Health Ontario. So, you know, I mean, but the three sort of core principles are really equity, which is that, you know, we do more for people who need more. Um, social justice, where we intend to, you know, balance intervention benefits and burdens for particular communities and participation where we engage the public in terms of the decision-making process and things that are going to affect them. And so I think, you know, and, and then the sort of fourth piece that I'd, you know, add into that is just empiricism, is that, you know, we are far enough along into this pandemic that we are able to make decisions in a way that is really responsive to the data at hand. So when I think about like what we've seen, I'll note like, you know, when, so we, we provide care, um, as I noted, in, in shelters and have been doing that. And particular shelter I work in is, is a shelter for elderly men uh, in Toronto. And, you know, we knew immediately from day one that like once somebody was suspected under, with COVID, right, they just couldn't go back to the shelter setting because we were so afraid of outbreaks happening. And we immediately set up this isolation site and we're working on it. But I think, you know, what, what also became apparent to me is that like, you know, similar to other respiratory outbreaks in the past, whether it be other coronaviruses, whether it be H1N1, is that there are particular areas and particular settings of folks that are affected and are more affected than others. And, and so, you know, we, at the time, you know, were, were really interested in a response that would be, you know, responsive to what we were seeing in the data. And that was very rapid um, disparities that emerged by, you know, generally speaking, by living and working conditions. And I think that sort of intersects with racial disparities in many places, more clearly so in the US, but even, you know, in Canada, where, you know, I think our universal health and education systems don't, you know, overcome, you know, the sort of structural racism that underpins a lot of a lot of society. And I think we started seeing that, but now, you know, the response wasn't, you know, responsive to that. 
and it and it, it still isn't. And so I think you know when as we're in this conversation, you know what we've seen, we saw it in wave one, where you know folks in shelter settings were 19 times more likely to, to be affected by COVID. Folks obviously in long-term care facilities more than 60 times more likely uh, to be affected by COVID. But in community transmission, in terms of non-facility-based transmission, we saw these rapid disparities in terms of particular communities. First, we saw it in terms of like a spatial layout, like we saw concentrations in certain parts of Toronto, and then we went deeper into, you know, the, the sort of neighborhoods and then the DAs of the demographic areas. And you just keep seeing this incredible concentration, but our responses weren't, you know, kind of addressing those folks with particular services. And you saw immediately that as the lockdown happened, you know, like it, it didn't affect a lot of people's lives. Those folks who are like, you know, we know famously the bakery now that we didn't hear about until later, but people are still baking bread and Uber is still happening and Amazon and the distribution centers are all happening and trucks are coming into this province. And the responses were not addressing the needs of those folks at all. And restrictions were not addressing them and they weren't out of work. So they're not like, it's like serve is not part of the story because they're still working. Mm. And so I think that was, you know, that, that sort of element of this, like just, just such inequity. And it felt very like fundamentally un-Canadian, you know? And, and so we always, cause it's easy to look at South and under now, fortunately with a new administration, but it's easy to look South and say, oh, well it's, it's Trump and it's politics down there, but it's like, we weren't being responsive to particular needs. And, and I think we've continued uh, down that pathway. And, and so I would like us, you know, one of the conversations I'd like is, is again, this sort of return to Canadian values of public health, not making them up. They're well-written, well-ascribed, you know, and, and, and endorsed broadly, and a return to empiricism. And I look forward to the conversation getting in the weeds on that. Yeah, you know, I, I love it. And, and, like, just to echo what Stefan's saying is that literally – you know, all the restrictions, all the measures that we're putting in, I shouldn't say all, a lot of the measures that we're putting in aren't addressing the problem spots, you know, like the racialized communities, the essential workers, factory workers. And so, Zane, what, like what, what comes to mind in terms of like how we could be addressing it? You know what I mean? Like, because obviously what we're, we've been doing hasn't been um, successful. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I what Stefan had said about the SARS report, right? It's a good launching point of where we were and where we are today. But, you know, people keep asking me about that report. We, you know, SARS was an illness that affected a, a particular part of Toronto that, you know, the, the province prepared for, but really, thankfully, we were not onslaughted by. Um, COVID-19, you know, we should be generating our data and our, our focus and how we, how we deal with things and sustainable practices on COVID-19 based on our experience with COVID-19. And I, I don't understand why today we are still doing things that we did at the beginning of the pandemic as we've learned 10 months of principles around this disease, the virology, you know, the way you practice in ICU has completely changed. 180, you know what I'm saying? But yet the way we approach problems in our community the way we focus trying to get rates down, the way we try to protect the vulnerable populations, the, the approaches are very, is very similar, but we have so many better tools right now, you know, and, and really as we're starting to talk about what's the next step, as we start getting people vaccinated, as we start seeing rates, you know, declining in Ontario, thankfully as they are, um, you know, how do we make sure that in the next six months, we're not doing this again, we're not doing this jumble every two or three months. And I think there's lots of different things that we need to address. There are super sustainable practices that we can build in today, such that one month, two months, three months, and six months later, we can work through our problems. And so, you know, testing is a big thing. You know, there are places in Ontario right now where it takes three plus days to get a test result. So I'm a marginalized person who works two jobs, who has to deal with their children. I... T take two days to find an appointment somewhere to go get tested for a runny nose. It takes me three days to get a result. And then, you know, if it's negative, fine, I can go back to work. I don't get paid for any of that time, even with the CSRB or whatever it is. Um, and, and yet we have better tools, right? And, and so you, you expect, you know, people to come out of the woodwork, go get tested, 
wait the five days and go home. And, you know, we have rapid tests now. I know they're not the best, but at the same time, you put them in clinics where people are getting tested. You give them easy access to testing. You tell people with the sensitivity issues, if you have a negative test, don't go into long-term care, don't go into your hospital job, but generally you can interact with the community okay with a mask on, wait for your PCR result, and then we'll do the final confirmation. I would much rather have 50% more people coming to our testing centers to come get tested, to get a result that may not be perfect, identify people at our testing centers so they can directly be be linked with public health because we know there are people in every public health unit who have a positive test that can't be reached after their positive test. Mm. You know, so you have a waiting audience, a captive audience who can offer supports, you can offer an isolation center if you need. If you have a vulnerable population like the scarcely housed, you can find a place for them to isolate. You don't have to find them again. You know, you have all these steps in place. But we've been sitting on these rapid tests saying, well, they're not good enough. Let's see, maybe long-term care, which is important. And I think they're, they're being implemented there after a, a significant amount of effort and validation. But there's, there's a way to make this sustainable. Why aren't we doing it? You can do both tests in these clinics, but it, it just gives a result. And, you know, these types of sustainable practices, we need to start thinking about this for the next six months, a year. We're not eliminating COVID. We're going to always have a need for testing, for isolation, for, for you know, public health management, for what when things start getting out of control, for how to deal with our industries and, and essential services coming back to normal. Mm-hmm. Why aren't we building that up now? Why aren't we using the time for lockdown to start building it up so that we don't go through this again in a month or two? I, I completely love this. So we're going to jump into a couple of key points. So, but before that, I just want to give Heidi a chance to, to say, like, in terms of what you've seen work well in, in terms of, you could speak in terms of whatever you want in terms of COVID before we dive into some of the specifics, but what are some of the elements that in your um, evaluations that you think should be universal? Yeah. So, I mean, some of it builds on what Steph said at the beginning, let's do the basics of communication well first. So that includes things like let's build rapport with the people we're talking about, avoid the blame games. That's a basic. Um, there's a you know CDC handbook that was used by Washington State during the pandemic and wasn't used by New York State to give some examples from the US. And we see the difference in results, right? So a lot of this is let's do the things we know we need to do. Let's have one main communicator who people can trust who speaks in a clear way that people can understand. Um, Let's meet people where they're at, which in a social media era means you have to meet people on Snapchat and Facebook and Twitter, and you need to have graphics, you need to have videos, et cetera. You need the institutional capacity to do that. Places like Taiwan, for example, to, to go back to the question of SARS, you know, Taiwan learned from SARS and didn't just do a report, really instituted reforms that have really come to fruition this time with COVID because they had great communications and they had a whole strategy behind it. It was was called humor over rumor. So the idea was that you combated this with fun things. So they have in Taiwan a spokes dog who knew, but they use the spokes dog to tell you, you know, you're supposed to be a meter and a half away from people. That's three Shiba Inus. So those are the little posters, right? And there's all sorts of fun stickers and things. And that's to combat rumors, right? It's this great, like don't delete stuff. Let's use humor over rumor. That's part of what they learned from SARS, that rumor was really part of what undid you. So I think we can use some of these basic principles. We can do that now. And then we can go into the higher level stuff of what we need to do to sort of implement risk communication, how we can use sort of higher order stuff. But I think the basic message is there's lots of things we could do right now. We could choose one person in Ontario who's a fab communicator. Um, Mm. We could really get public health officials connecting with um, civil society, including, for example, the South Asian COVID-19 task force, which is doing an awesome job. I'll give you one super concrete example, and then we'll wrap up. So Doug Ford, I think he got criticized for his French or something. So he released a video today of him saying, stay at home in 22 languages of varying qualities of pronunciation, but we'll leave that aside. Think about how much better that video would be if it was Doug Ford saying it in English, and then 22 people from those different communities speaking in their languages to people. That is a whole different message that brings in civil society into this, speaking in ways that make sense to people, whether it's Polish, German, Punjabi, Hindi, whatever else it is. So some of this stuff, as I said, super simple, we could do it tomorrow. Some takes a little bit longer, um, but I think the message is there's a lot 
more that we could do. Um, and some of it goes along with what Zane and Stefan were saying. Let's use this opportunity now to bring in the stuff that we know works. I looked at six months of data on COVID and I brought out a report in September. We got a lot of strategies on the table from other countries that have dealt with COVID extremely effectively. And also that didn't necessarily need to use lockdowns. South Korea didn't, uh, Taiwan didn't use a lockdown. So we don't have to go down the New Zealand route to be successful. Wow. Uh, Steph, I wasn't sure if you unmuted because you were going to say something or. I'm... Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's exactly right. I mean, you know, the, the often what we've seen throughout this response has been this sort of like wholesale comparison against dramatically different countries. And indeed, like the one that's most commonly done is like a small island in the Pacific, you know, and and and, and you know, we are a place where we have, you know, in Ontario specifically, like 10,000 trucks entering every single day, you know, and we have, so it's like 10,000 trucks entered yesterday and 10,000 trucks will enter tomorrow. And you could say, close the border, fine. But the reality is that what you're going to do then is like, we don't make anything in this country. I should note this. Like, I was like, we make honey crisp apples a couple weeks a year. So we are going to be in a position, right. To like, where all of a sudden these things are, like the things that have kept people comfortable throughout these lockdowns are all of a sudden no longer going to be available. And what that tells us is those of us who can work remotely, obviously many of the folks here do work in person, clinical work, obviously in person and whatnot, but we've been kept comfortable by the folks that are still out there and are working. And we've like the lockdowns have not addressed their needs at all. And those data could not be clear. Like in this second wave, the, the sort of um, the wave among essential workers is literally a straight line up. And those folks who are, you know, working from home and who are generally higher income, it's been an increase, but it's not been that high, which is reflective of the fact that they're home. And, and so I think that, you know, we need to start moving from this idea of like, you know, that restrictions are going to bring us out of this into a way of saying, what are people's unmet needs? How do we address those needs with, you know, specific services and whether, you know, and the most obvious one is like, and we'll talk about this, but like paid leave just in terms of whether it be outbreaks in hospitals or shelters or long term care facilities, any of these settings, you know, fundamental. How do we provide people, as Zane was saying, housing supports? Because, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share. Well, I'll just share very briefly yeah, that, yeah. you know, when when in on March 15th, we set up this this, you know, we had our site up and running and, you know, we. um we had our site up and running and people would come into, you know, we would get calls from Emerge. We were getting 60, 70 calls a day from Emerge discharge planners. And what was happening was that we could only bring in folks into our isolation site that were within the homeless system, basically. And anybody else who was like, you know, you're telling them, listen, you have COVID, go home and isolate. And they're like, where do you want me to isolate? How, where am I supposed to isolate in my place? We live where, you know, live multiple folks in the, in the household. There are no private space. We have less than one room per person per household. So probably about 80 to 90% of those folks we were sending back into their homes to infect everybody in that household. And by the time Including we didn't grandma, get them, who's no, got exactly, multi-generational and... household to infect everybody in that household who would then end up in the ICU. And we knew it. And it was to sort of, they knew it that they couldn't isolate. We, the system knew that we couldn't help them. And so I think it was things along those lines of like really integrating services into the system to begin with was fundamental and not overestimating that like lockdowns, you know, brought us out of this thing in March. You know, there was sort of this thing of like, oh, well, we had these lockdowns and thus it slowed down in April. I'm like, you know, the problem with like not accepting, not that to get too much into seasonality, but then not accepting that, you know, this virus had some seasonal element to it is that you overestimated the benefit of the interventions in yeah. spring and underestimated what you needed to do to prevent a real wave, you know, a real winter wave. Like there was, there was sort of two problems with that. And so I think that's, you know, uh, you know, part of these challenges is that we've not addressed people's fundamental needs. And thus we've seen these, you know, just the disparities getting worse and worse and worse to the point when it is like, you know, it, it's like the defining characteristic globally of this pandemic is how unequal it's been in terms of, of, of burden in different communities. Zane, you can look I like just, you were going to jump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, going back to Heidi's point about blame, and I think this is something that keeps coming up over and over again. And somehow between the beginning of when this started to now, you know, anyone doing anything virtuous or fun or, you know, enjoying themselves 
in in some setting now is associated with with you know disdain in that sense and it's funny because throughout all of this as we talked about different measures to slow down transmission in the communities you know i i think in the summertime we started talking there was that 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 outbreak at the brass rail and everyone is like why are strip clubs open you know and it was it was a lot of virtue signaling saying well strip clubs are, are the problem here why are they open they're causing transmission shut them down you know and at the end of the day i think it was a handful of cases of co- as of the brass rail there were strip clubs across the country that were operating effectively and fine but moral judgment came in is like blame, blame, blame. And Trinity Bellwoods, that was the other example oh, yeah. where blame started showing up, right? People were pissed off by Trinity Bellwoods. You saw a bunch of young kids out and about, happy as a clam, you know, pretending that COVID didn't exist because they are 20 years old and they were sitting indoors for the last three months and wanted to do something normal with life. The science suggested outdoors is way more safer than indoors. But everyone got, you know, out of whack. They thought we were going to have a second wave because of that alone in Toronto, and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we saw other things happen during the summer protests and all that other stuff where people, you know, put their different value judgments along that line in terms of virtue and that type of thing, saying things need to be shut down. Then it became restaurants, and restaurants were the problem, and bars were the problem, and everyone blamed that, and then we shut them down. Then it became fitness centers, and fitness centers are the problem, and then we shut it down. You know, and, and, and now we're starting to talk about, well, go outside with the mask, don't congregate it with anyone, you know, shut down par- parks and public spaces like in Vaughan because we can't police them properly. And it's all of a sudden like we, doing the things that make us human, that give us joy have been aligned with causing COVID. And, you know, anything that isn't, you know, sitting in your home, watching Netflix is, co- you know, causing COVID. And, and really, you know, you have to give people the benefit of the doubt. I would rather have... 50 people outdoors in a skating rink than 10 people watching the basketball in game indoors and getting COVID from an indoor and the science supports that. So why now in just January, January, you know, in a Canadian winter, we're not talking about hyping up parks. We're not talking about an outdoor experience for people. We're not talking about how to do things safely, how to meet your family outdoors even and have a walk together. We're saying stay in your bubbles, stay away. Don't go outdoors wear a mask, you know, like there, there's a lot of this that's, that's just become a blame game rather than a, how to, how to lower risk, but be human. 100%. Yeah. If I can jump in on that, I think for this sure. is the point, right? Is that I think this is part of people sort of getting into this field for the first time is the idea that either you're perfect or everything's a failure, but the truth is public health is always about, you know, increments, right? Like all the advice I give about communications is never expecting hundred percent of people are going to agree, but that one, two, three percent in the right places, that all makes a difference. And I think we've, we've kind of gotten away from that. So the expectation is one tiny slip up is the end of the world, but no, we're try- what we're trying to do is, help people figure out how do you live a a life that is still fulfilling in some way, knowing that there are many costs to what we're asking people to do that we're only starting to see, right, in terms of mental health, secondary effects that I'm sure we can talk about. And I think what I would say, though, is you can see in BC that at a certain point, Bonnie Henry, the chief medical officer, really had to withstand a lot of pressure to tell people to still go outdoors. There was a huge amount of pressure online to get her to shut down outdoors even more. And it was to her credit that she said no and came up with slogans like fewer faces in outdoor spaces as a way to try and give people an idea of what they should be doing. So I think one of the ways to talk about this is to figure out how do we give people layers of protection? I mean, there's this wonderful graphic by Ian McKay, which is lots of layers of Swiss cheese, right? And each Mm -hmm. one has some holes in it. Nothing is perfect. A mask isn't perfect. Neither is meeting outdoors, but everyone makes a little bit less virus go through. And I think we've lost that communication right it's become an all or nothing but if we can get back to let's communicate with people different people in different types of professions have different levels of risk they've got their different layers of swiss cheese it's much more effort than one press conference on a podium but it's going to be much more effective and i think it it gets back to that kind of joyful humor over rumor um place like senegal also had you know joyful things in dakar there was a graffiti group which went around and painted these beautiful murals of people wearing a mask And I thought it was really inspirational, right? There was actually something beautiful about wearing a mask and then you were reminded to do it and there was a creativity to it. So I think this idea of nothing is perfect. If it's not 100%, that's okay. We just keep going. We have more science and we talk about layers of protection and risk communication. We've just seen too little of that, I think, but we can improve it. This is is it. I mean, I, I love the communication piece because 
we've lost the kind of principle of speak to your audience, which I think is so beautiful, right? Like, you know, that the 23 year old university students not listening at one o'clock to hear Ford tell his, do his thing or whoever's going to be in the mix, right? Like who knows who's telling the, uh, giving the announcement. So this is what I think is so beautiful. So communication, as we mentioned, one person, simple messaging, um, speaking to your audience, um, and that holistic approach. And this is why we're here, actually, just so we could try and get back to that holistic approach. Um, because obviously, that we've talked many times about the secondary implications of, of, um, of, uh, of COVID uh, and our response. So maybe getting back to some of the more concrete steps forward. So we talked about communication. We talked a bit about rapid testing. So I'm, I'm going to go back to Zane, actually, on the rapid testing. Like, just to totally be clear as day, because we had a show, I think it's our last show, uh, Julia, where we, we uh, there's a long-term care facility that was piloting using uh, um, rapid testing, and they were doing it parallel with their PCR. And they picked up on, like, one case was PCR negative three days before, Three days after that, they come and visit their loved one. The rapid test positive and totally, in my opinion, like significantly reduce the risk of like an outbreak at their facility, like a, a major outbreak. Um, so where would you like concrete want to see rapid testing implemented within like whether that's long term care, whether it's throughout the uh, other sectors, factories, where would you like to see it? Yeah, I mean, number one symptomatic individuals. I think that, that like I, as much as we sold this test and I think I was even one of this came out saying, oh, asymptomatics are the target for it. There is still an argument that symptomatic individuals getting a test up front may help with starting the process off. And again, mm. they're the highest probability individuals. And we do it, right? Malaria, we have a rapid test that's often followed by a smear. HIV and high risk individuals, we do a rapid test and then send it off because there is something powerful about diagnosing someone at the bedside when they're a captive audience That's a really good rather point. than That's a really down, good down point. the line, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, long-term care is a great example. We now have rapid tests, the pan bio that are nasal swap. So you don't even have to get the NPS. I would be putting those into every long-term care facility, resourcing them, getting volunteers from the community, getting other people hired into long-term care such that everyone has a resolved test by the time they walk into long-term care. It's not hard. It's a 15 minute test. You know, it, you know, you can train someone how to do it probably within 30 minutes. If you've done five tests, I think you're on, you're pretty much an expert at this point. Um, but you know, there is so much power there knowing that the line for long-term care is so small before you get these outbreaks. We're now hearing about variants going into long-term care, you know, identifying positive cases at the door before they talk to people is going to be the biggest you know, bang for the buck here. And we have a tool for it. They've been doing this in the United States for months and months and months as part mm. of their care facilities. They had ID nows, they had antigen tests. Yes, you have to get PCRs. Yes, there are going to be false positives. And you have to make sure that, you know, you can staff appropriately while you're trying to resolve those and that type of thing. But at the end of the day, if the consequence is death, then, then you know, you, you do have to use them seriously. I think we validated them enough. The companies have validated them enough. And I think, yeah, like big factories, Amazon, that type of thing, there is a role but, you know, that last example and even the long-term care example, you have to also tie it to the ability to, to do something positive with a positive test, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to roll this out into an Amazon plant or I'm going to do this into a manufacturing plant when people are making minimum wage, some people may be undocumented being paid under the table. I'm going to say, oh, yeah, get tested every time you come in. What's my incentive to do that? If I don't, if I feel fine and I know if I get a positive test, I'm out for 10 days and I don't have mm -hmm. employment anymore, right? So, you know, the rapid tests are there. I think there's good use cases, but they're not going to be perfect on their own. And you have to tie some of that social support, sick day pay, the taking care of people as part of that. Otherwise, people may be scared to kind of take it up in, in, in full steam in that sense. Very good point, Zane, which I, I think might be overlooked is that the, the action step, right? Like, the, which, um, you know, it ties in well with the, as you mentioned, the paid leave. And I mean, we might as well hit that up. Like, I know we touched on it a bit. Uh, Steph, maybe you want to like hammer that home yeah. a little bit, like really, yeah. like we gave a good example, Zane, why it matters, but really why does it matter in your opinion, Steph? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it matters because every outbreak that I've seen or managed has been started by, and I say this actually with, I don't blame these folks at all because in the same situation, I, I'd make the same decision they did, but every outbreak has been started by a staff member who's on the margins. Like there was recently kind of famous in Ottawa, this case about a, an outbreak in a long-term care facility by somebody who lives in a homeless shelter. I'm like, actually a lot of our staff who, of homeless shelters live in homeless shelters. I don't think people realize like, they're like, oh, that must be somewhere far away where that happens. I'm like, no, it's our, you know, this is the dynamic in many of our cities. People are on the margins. Some of our shelters, like they're city employees and they have benefits and, 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 and that, I'll tell you, helps manage these outbreaks really easily because folks just go home for 10 days and they're, they're fine with it. Then they come back to work. In the places where like, you know, there are, you know, they're backfilled agency hires, contract hires, which by the way, is like half the people in the building, right? You know, they face every time they wake up with like symptoms, they face this like Sophie's choice of like, do I tell my boss that, you know, I have symptoms and I, I'm, I gotta be off the roster for 14 days? Or do I just go to work because it's just the sniffles and everybody I see with COVID is in the ICU. So it can't be COVID. And I don't really want to get tested for it because again, like it just puts me in a really dangerous place of like facing eviction or not being able to feed my family, et cetera. So there's like just some very basic things that at this point we need to overcome. The housing support one, as I noted, was fundamental back in March. Most of the calls we took from COVID assessment centers were like, can you take these folks in to isolation? And the answer was always no. If we had at this point, and I just, I find it amazing that in January, we're still having these conversations, but if we had integrated in like a, a simple assessment of, do you have a place in your household to isolate? No. Do you live in a multi-generational household? Yes. We have a spot for you. You know what I mean? Like we have a but spot in the COVID. Spot. No, I know yeah. empty. We have empty and we have places for you to go. And you know what? Because we have a high index of suspicion because you have new onset symptoms and you sound like it's a good story for COVID. We're going to have you go there before you get your test results back. Worst case scenario, it comes back negative and, and you know, you can go home. Voluntary, no police, pleasant, nice hotels, et cetera. And the answer is most folks would take it. Most folks, when given that option, would take that rather than nobody wants to infect their family. Nobody wants to hurt their parents. You're just not giving them any choice. And so I think like, the, you know, our over-reliance on restrictions have put us in a place where like, I, I think I saw some chats where like, this is same old, same old. I'm like, well, if it's same old, why isn't it standard by now? Why isn't anything that we're actually saying right now part of like the practice? Maybe it's amazing that we're still having these conversations in January of 2021, but the reality is like restrictions are not gonna bring us out of this pandemic. Yeah. They're just not, they're not. They never were and they never will. And so I think here we're talking about a series of resources that relate to two fundamental things, where people live and where people work. And if we address those two dynamics of how people live and, and how people work, which by the way, are not in their immediate control, right? Like you can't just change where you live and where you work. You can change if you go up to dinner, you know what I mean? I'm not going to go up for dinner. You can't be like, I'm not going to work there anymore in the same day. So, you know, we need that part of what Zane was saying is like, there's this mismatch between like social problems right? And individual choices. We think this is like, because people went tobogganing, they all got COVID. It's like, no, it's because they delivered you stuff. They worked at Amazon and delivered you something to your door. And that Amazon distribution center is full of COVID. And that's the dynamic that we're not addressing. And I'm not saying shut down Amazon. I'm like, let's invest in, you know, infection prevention control. Let's get into these places. Let's take, let's help them do this. We can do this in public health. I know how to work on like occupational health stuff. We have occupational health specialists that can help do this. We're just doing none of it because we think that like closing school, what closing whatever, strip clubs is, strip clubs is the ultimate example because I'll, I'll finish by saying this. is like the thing that we were taught in residency, in public health residency in Canada, in Toronto is like, don't chase unicorns. Don't chase unicorns. It's easy. And strip clubs are like the ultimate unicorn. Right. It's like it's newsworthy. It, 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 you know, as it, Heidi was talking about, like risk communication, like it's got all the outrage factors, like it's frivolous. You know, it's already judgmental or stigmatizing. And so closing that is totally non sequitur to like a meaningful public health response. But it just looks like you're doing something. And I think we need to get now from the optics of like superficial kind of non impactful changes to things that are going to save lives, because, you know, 
at the end of the day, like Zane, you've taken care of folks who have died. Obviously, Budger, you've taken care of folks who have died. I've taken care of folks who have died. This thing is very real. It kills people. And, but, that, you know, but we have to get very real about, you know, starting to, to change those trends and like restrictions as, a, as the basis of the response are just not going to bring us there. And, and just to bring Steph's uh, like points home too, like number one, these like we have, as, as Steph was mentioning, the resources with public health and to be able to go to that Amazon factory and say, yo, what's up? We need to X, Y, Z, think about, um, you know, uh, these safety measures, make sure you're not eating that close to each other at lunch. Like these specialists and experts exist. All right. Totally. And and, you know, this needs to come to the forefront. The I heard this initiative in Vermont. I was listening to um, oh, our boys of Vinay's podcast. You got you're on Vinay's podcast. Um, and they were and they give out, uh, I think, at the testing center. A thousand bucks. They give. Well, I don't know about if that's true. No, but, it's a thousand bucks. OK, wow. I would say I was going to say vouchers for places. No, no, to it's stay. a thousand bucks in Vermont. Oh, they gave out a grant. For people who didn't have money, not everybody, it's not, you know, we don't need to give this to rich people. Yeah. You know what I mean? But you do it based on, you know, they gave people in Vermont, they gave them a grant to, to support their isolation. And yeah. by the way, it's like, what, they're like north of New York and south of Quebec. They should be full of COVID. Yeah. And they've just done so much better than every other place. Absolutely. You know? And we, we have a plan to give people money who get COVID or need to isolate the CSRB, which is legitimately you have to, go online you have to have a bank account you have to have a sin number you get your money maybe in three days it's less than minimum wage and you get taxed on it is it still no, it's 450 it it's basically they 450. Keep 50 but it's 450 for yeah. a maximum of two weeks and it takes yeah. at least a week and you have to reapply the second so you have to like yeah you have to reapply for the second week like it's la- it's 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 unbelievable, actually. Like and, it's, and, it's unbelievable. And, but just to put context, just I'm going to put my ICU flavor on this a bit, okay? So, like, the stories, like, when I walk into my ICU, it is almost always the, and I'm dead serious, it's almost always in a multi-generational home in an essential worker somehow is tied to the home where the, the restrictions aren't working. So, like, I had a buddy uh, living in uh, the GTA area, one of the hard-hit spots. He was telling him, you know, essential worker, he's, he's got, uh, well, I think he's 16 people living in his house. No one could isolate. He's going home and he, they know he's going home with the COVID and no one, no one could isolate. He's, and you know, grandma's got her diabetes or mild obesity. And yes, she lands in an ICU. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, this is not, this is not make believe. This isn't theory. This is legit. And the spots, and let me tell you, the spots that are getting the hardest hit in, in, in the GTA, you, you've seen it. It's Scarborough, Peel, essential workers, multi-generational homes. The formula is simple. You look at O-Town, Ottawa, sorry. We are a bougie town. So many people living in, uh, like, uh, being able to do the, the um, work from home, doing it via Zoom. You know what I'm saying? We don't have as many essential workers. We don't have as many factory workers. We have less multi-generational home and we have never been hit. We've been blessed because of uh, the the structure of our our city. And just think about this. So like you hear where the problem spots are clear, but you are not hitting them and you're adding these restrictions. You're talking about gyms closing. You know what I'm saying? I'm telling you, my essential worker is not going to the gym right now. He's not going to the gym. You know what I'm saying? Let's think about this. I'll give you a great example. So, you know, we know Toronto, right? Starborough, East York, Etobicoke, hit hard. They've been hit hard through the, the entire pandemic. A great article released in the Globe and Mail today looking at where, who, so they looked at cell phone mobility data and who traveled overnight to a place during the Christmas holiday. So really legitimately, I mean, if you're traveling overnight, for the most part, either you're going to your cottage or you're going to a family's house, you're leaving the city. Guess where it was? So the mobility, you know, all this stuff, we need to, you know, lock down Christmas. Etobicoke, Scarborough, East York were the lowest mobility in the city. People are adhering to the public health measures. But when you restrict them, they're the ones who still have to work. They're the ones who put food in your grocery store. They're the ones who deliver your Amazon package. The 
area between Young and St. Clair, the Young and 401, which all of us know is Midtown, you know, very, very lush area, and the, the area of Etobicoke, where, which is much better off, were the ones that left the city more, that spent time overnight, that violated the public health rules. Mm. But the bird, you know, and again, we, we, we are, you know, everyone needs to stay home. Well, the people that are staying home are staying home, but they're also going to work to make sure that we can stay home, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I think if I can sorry, jump honey. in, yeah, you know, this do. is this is where the communication has been a big mismatch, right? So I remember, you know, you can obviously hear from my accent that I did not grow up in Canada, but rather in the UK. And I was, you know, listening to Trudeau's press conferences every morning because this is obviously what I do for work. And I remember he was talking about, okay, I'm going to address the people who um, might have a cottage and they want to go to the cottage. I thought, what is this strange Canadian vocabulary? What is this cottage? I need to realize, you know, many Canadians apparently have cottages, but this is clear, like, that's a particular group of people that you were addressing. Um, <laughs> and that is very not, very much not the people that Steph and Zane are talking about. So even if we think about what is the communication here, who, who are you speaking to? Uh, when you're talking uh, as the prime minister or who are you speaking to in these different places when you're talking about people going on skiing holidays, non-essential travel, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and maybe the second point here is that I've basically been talking about communication as if it's you know just from public health officials outwards, it's one way, but it really isn't, right? Great mm -hmm. communication is two way. It's also active listening. Um, one thing that BC did pretty early on was a very big survey. I think about 400,000 people replied uh, talking about their experience of COVID, various types of information, et cetera. I wish we'd done more with it, but I think we need even more of that kind of active listening. You know, social media provides a bazillion ways to do that. But you could even just do what South Korea did, which is they have an office of communications. In February, they just picked 50 individuals from South Korean society and asked them, are we doing a good job communicating? Uh, how mm -hmm. can we do better? How can we avoid, you know, for example, uh, stigmatizing LGBTQ plus people, which became a problem. So if we've done more of that two-way communication, we see, all right, there are lots of people we're not reaching with this kind of discourse that's obviously very particular to the people who have a cottage. <laughs> uh, how do we actually communicate with others? That includes the many languages, et cetera. And we've seen great civil society stuff come into the mix. Uh, there's a really neat initiative here, which was aimed at a lot of people who are Sikh. How do you wear a mask when you've got a turban? Right. Wow. That's, it's a great it's a great question that actually is really important to a large number of people in B.C. and civil society stepped in there. But how can we help with that kind of stuff? So just to say communications also can have a major class component here, along with, you know, race and gender. Yeah, totally. And it needs to be two way. And we've really sort of need to step up to the line. there. That is a brilliant point, Julia. We got to note the uh, two way communication, because that I think that we are that is not the end implemented in any shape or form okay right. got, but, but can i can i can i make one point on that sure. but it's also like not only is it not speaking to certain folks obviously because the person's like it's a like cottage have to do with it but it's also the idea of like the people who aren't going to their cottages are like see i'm sacrificing too you know what i mean like i sacrifice i you know we all got we all got to sacrifice and by the way like you know i mean it's just been sort of this constant thing i'm like you don't know sacrifice I mean, and I don't either. I'm, I'm just, I mean, but like you, you see it, you know, you know that it's happening out there. People who like, we keep saying this like false, like, oh, I don't care about the economy, whatever. It's like, yeah, you don't care about the economy because like you're comfortable. Do you know what I mean? Let's hear that from somebody who lost their job, who's facing eviction, who doesn't know they're going to like put food on the table. Let's hear them say, you know what? I don't care. The economy is irrelevant. It's like to many folks, the economy is irrelevant. You know, like they've been fine throughout this time. When you hear from folks who are on the margins, actually economy and employment is a social determinant of health and it's fundamentally important. And so just to like, it's part of this idea of this, like this such harsh rhetoric around it, that even the thing that we are having today, I remember I, I saw on your Twitter that people are like, oh, we're, we're great Barrington hideaways. We're deniers, we're this and that. <laughs> and it's like, you know what? Like it's, it's just part of this like unbelievable rhetoric where like, if you don't believe in some singular approach to this, so you don't get behind the like the narrative that you have to, that you're supposed to, then all of a sudden that you don't value A, people's lives or people's well-being. And it's 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 ridiculous. It's like the ultimate gaslight in my mind. I'm like, you know, because it so I, I don't I mean I don't want to go too too far into it, but I think that this idea of like closing down discussion, even among folks who are like highly educated specialized or more importantly folks with lived experience we should hear from these people who have lost their jobs lost uh, you know other things and 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 think about how we're going to address their needs 
as part of a functional society moving forward or, or, you know, I just don't think we're going to get very far at all. Yeah. I, it's, I mean, without hearing how it, if, from the people that it's affecting directly, I think is obviously a, a, a mistake. We got, we got two major topics that I want to be able to hit before uh, we get into questions. So what, uh, we're, I'm not even sure how to play this out. Uh, schools. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, how are we going to start this? So Ontario obviously didn't uh, open schools in large parts of the, of the, the province, including Ottawa, Toronto, GTA. Um, what's the question? How do I frame this question? Zane, any, any thoughts on the fact that we are the only province, I shouldn't, I shouldn't frame that that way. We're the only province, only province not opening schools, but what's any, what are you, how do you feel about that decision and what factors do you think we need to um, think about when opening or closing schools? Yeah. So I, I will, I will reemphasize what you were saying, right? Despite everything across the country, every other province has prioritized school reopening. And I think this goes back to this point of, you know, we're using the precautionary principle. We're going back to, you know, what we thought was appropriate. Schools have been open for four months and we didn't learn any lessons from that. We don't know, you know, we're still debating whether or not transmission occurs in schools, whether or not it's the tip of the iceberg and asymptomatic transmission, whether or not they really fuel what's going on in our communities. We shut down schools. We're looking at graphs now saying that percentage positivity is higher in kids. Oh, it must have been the school. But, you know, the, you know, behaviors have changed because kids have screened very differently when they're sitting at home over the Christmas break versus when their parents are trying to get them back to school and have a runny nose and they need to get them tested, right? We so, test probability, yo. It is, right? And and so, you know, we keep having this debate. I am not going to say that schools don't contribute to some transmission in their communities, but it is not as simple as saying closing the schools will solve all of our problems, right? And I think you have to value a that schools are a precious place in society, that childhood development is incredibly important, that there is a gain, these communities we talk about where they're incredibly reliant on schools as a way to, to get their kids educated because their house is chaotic, that they, they'll have to bring in caregivers to deal with their children in that sense. Their means of employment and being able to provide their children virtual education is non-existent. Uh, and so, you know, we, we do have to put this on the table, recognizing, and I think the crazy part of right now is everything else is closed. So why wouldn't you open up schools? You have all the resources of public health, as Stefan had said, they know how to do this. They've been doing this through the pandemic. You now have better resources and rapid tests. You can do your experiment to say if schools are affecting transmission, and if they are, you can shut them down again. But this is the time, right? Like, you know, we are dealing with this now for four months. I was looking at an article I was doing with Matt Gurney in the summertime on, on schools. And, and, you know, all of those themes are still ongoing. Yes, we're not distancing appropriately. There are issues with schools in terms of ventilation. There is stuff that needs to be done there. But we haven't answered this question despite schools being open for four months. And I think this is the time we answer the question. Rather than subjecting kids to more time off, put them back. Look at what happens to your community transmission. Use your public health resources to track schools effectively. And if in two weeks you're seeing rates go up and it's directly attributable to schools, you have your answer. And we, we at least make a judgment to the rest of the country that this is the answer. But I can tell you, many other provinces have seemed to keep schools open despite hard lockdown measures across and yet they've been able to balance. You know, BC has still has cohorts of 40 in schools where masking is not even that mandatory other yeah. than in common areas. And they've made that a priority. Manitoba, when it was hitting a threshold of cases where they were overwhelming healthcare, left schools as a priority. So why aren't we being brave and at least answering the question in the next two to four weeks, open schools, put public health in, in charge and get the answer once and for all. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, this is mind blowing and was one of the main drivers of actually just doing this, this uh, gig right now, actually, the, the craziness behind school, not having our schools open. Um, Steph, maybe I was get your input too on, you know, if, if we were to open up schools tomorrow, do you feel like you would go to exactly what we're doing? Do we need to 
you know, add more masking? Do you feel like we need to add uh, rapid testing or asymptomatic testing? Like, what would you do anything different in terms of the approach? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that there's, I think similar to what Zane is saying, there are models all over Europe, all over Canada and large parts of the United States that are very similar in Europe socioeconomically and like, you know, kind of how we've set up our social systems to Canada that are in school, that have prioritized schools, that have shown us models that can include masking in some places. I will note in the United Kingdom, like masking has not been a major part of their story for kids. Uh, and and there they you know the, they've just come out with another report the ONS of national statistics with like that it just reflected background transmission and in low prevalent settings there was literally no cases in the schools there was no you know amongst either or students or pupils and and you know in higher prevalent settings there were as well as well and that was actually in the context of you know more spacing uh, but not masking wasn't a big part of their story and definitely more testing there they do random testing within the schools on, on, a, on a weekly basis. And they've been doing that for months. So I think that like, you know, the, the question is like, what is, what's, your, what's your fundamental priority? If like children's education is a fundamental human right, right? If that's, your, if that's your perspective, then you're gonna do everything possible to open schools. If your fundamental approach is that zero, like no COVID infections are all feasible and, and whatever we need to do to get there is just part of the story and part of the narrative. Then of course, like you'll just kind of close everything as we've done. And by the way, you know, even in the context of, of closed schools, we've seen a tremendous amount of burden. And so, you know, I think that like, it's just a different framing. When I look at, you know, I grew up in Sweden, I'm a Swedish and Canadian citizen, you know, and children's education, by the way, is fundamentally important for two reasons there. One, because it is the main pathway to upward mobility in any society, public education, right? And, and secondly, because my friends who are also providers, clinicians and whatnot were, didn't were like, what am I gonna do with my kids? They left, they closed schools for 16 and above basically universities and high schools. But like how old of a kid can you leave home alone? So if you work from home, it's fine. You can have a kid and you can take care of them. If you don't, which again is the same folks that we're talking about here and also clinicians and others, they have to work on site you at that point are unable to have a child home alone and you have to rely on grandparents or others to help you because it's the only way. So I, I think, you know, we, it, it's not, it's, it, it is obviously about education, but there are all of these other dynamics that are so fundamental that take, for example, like healthcare workers out of the game because they're home, you know, with their kids. And, and, and I think we've been so quick to make decisions around education in a way that feels like it's not an, I'll just say this, like it doesn't feel like an honest conversation at times. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I, I think everybody can sort of make of that what it is, but there's, it, I think it, it feels like, again, the most, the harshest part of this is like, if you want schools to open for some reason, you don't value teachers' lives, which is like, of course we do. You know, we value, and, and so it's, it, it, but that dichotomy has, has degraded the conversation to a point when you really can't engage in a meaningful way. And as a result of that, like you're, you know, as a result of that, here we are, where we're just, we can make no progress. We have parents on the one side and teacher unions on the other, and there's really no engagement because there's been this sort of vilification of everybody involved. And, and that, that there's just no possibility for progress in that sort of context. Yeah, I mean, the, the black and white isms a moralization of all this stuff has been the Achilles heel, like at all levels. It's been horrible. I'm calling us into the time. So I got, I got a question for Heidi real quick, and then we're going to take questions. Um, so, and to summarize, like, it sounds like we're pro, we would suggest uh, schools opening. You could leave us what you think in the um, Steph if, or Arzain, whoever, if you feel like we need to do more than what we've been doing before, uh, maybe pipe in after. But um, Heidi, we oh shit, um, vaccine hesitancy. I, I think we we need to get ahead of this game because like, uh, like we kind of had this conversation before we started. We know there's there's a problem there. A lot of times when it comes to our public health approach, we've been waiting for it to be a problem as a as opposed to like pro being proactive with this. So you um, sorry, a kid is coming in here, so I'm gonna mute. What do you think about how we could address that? Yeah. So this is a great question. I would say there's obviously been um, 
a long time question of vaccine uh, hesitancy and legitimate reasons for worries about that. But let's not get into that. Let's just draw, as Zane said, on the data we have about COVID-19. And what we know is if we are proactive, then that will work better. So someone did a big data study of 12 countries at the beginning of COVID and looked at how many people bought quack cures, right? Of all the things we know are massively debunked and found that in the countries where governments put out good guidelines rapidly, much less of the public bought quack cures. This is an obvious point to anybody who works on communications. George Lakoff told us this about metaphors decades ago, right? But we have proof from the beginning of COVID, right? That this is really important to be proactive. Now, there are some obvious things we need to explain. Uh, we need to do better at explaining what I call the meta-narrative of science. So how does science and how do trials really work? Why was it that we, it wasn't actually cutting corners? It was doing something simultaneously that we usually do sequentially, right? How did we already have research into mRNA? All that kind of stuff. Break it down into short one and a half, two minute videos get some of the smart people on board. Again, none of this is rocket science, but let's be proactive. We know how to do some of this. And what we want to make sure is that that kind of information is out there in a really accessible way. But particularly, I think this meta narrative of science, because that has really been missing, I think, from a lot of this conversation is helping people understand how does it work? Most people will never in their lives need to know what peer review is. And they should be happy because it's really a pain, right? But it's important. Um, so we need to help people understand what does that mean? What are trials? in a very, very simple way. So I'd love to see more of that. Let's get proactive, get a bunch of people. You know, you can think in the US, Arnold Schwarzenegger was talking about, um, he had a great Facebook comment saying, you know, I'm a bodybuilder. If someone wants to know how to get the perfect peak on the bicep, they come to me. But I go to scientists when I want to know whether to get a vaccine or not, right? But what we also need to do then is have that created in an accessible way uh, that people can go to. So that's what I'd love to see, lots more proactive. And the final thing I'll say is um, to avoid vilification. I think it's really important. It is, it, is, it is important and it is okay to have questions. Um, and I, I think we, we really are backing ourselves into a very, very problematic cul-de-sac. We don't allow people to ask questions. That's the whole point of scientific inquiry. Let's bring in those questions. Let's answer them. That's absolutely fine. It's totally fine to want to understand what are the potential side effects, to communicate around risk. Um, and I'll give you one super concrete example to end, which is, you know, there were questions at the beginning about allergies and vaccines. Um, and I have a very close family member who has a penicillin allergy. I've had really legitimate questions, you know, is, is the vaccine gonna be okay for me? Um, but when and found people to help her, who listened, who gave her advice and said, listen, you know, as we're going through, it seems gonna be fine. Here's the setting I'd advise you to go, have it with a nurse, et cetera, et cetera. But it was the listening rather than shaming her for having questions um, that meant that she's gonna be fine getting a vaccine now. So just to give sort of concrete examples, there are legitimate questions, you've got to answer them, you've got to be proactive, and that's how we're going to get somewhere with this rather than shaming people. I, I, I don't know if this is fair to say, but I love it when you throw down Heidi because it, you, it just makes so much sense. Like I can guarantee everybody when they're hearing that, we're like, yes, exactly. Why are we not being proactive? The messaging can be simple. You know, what is exactly? I love the idea with the, the oh, like the, um, you know, how we came about the, to get through the trial so quickly. What is an mRNA vaccine? Why, what was the technology? Why we were confident in it? Like, absolutely. Like we got a bunch of talented people right now sitting at home, they could dance with some software, you know what I'm saying? And, and throw down, I, I don't know. It just, it makes so much sense when you hear it. Um, but yeah, I thank you for that. So unless I'm gonna actually, before going into questions, any other things, panelists, that come to mind? And once again, action steps that we could, if you were in the ear of Doug Ford, high yield that we, you, you feel like we haven't covered in terms of ways of moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the one thing I kind of want to make, it, it's actually a bit of a broader statement, but it's that like if the future of public health is like, restriction based like people keep feeling like this is a once in a lifetime pandemic and and i'm gonna say it's not it's not a once in a lifetime pandemic and whether it's in the 2020s or before 2025 like we may find ourselves in a very similar boat to the one that we're in right now so you know i mean i, I think part of this is like we're gonna have to learn to manage public health in the social media age in a way that still holds it, you know, within the, within the sort of the power of public health, the core public health principles, not avoid politicizing 
a public health issue to the extent that obviously it has been, you know, for the, for the last year. And, and, and also like, you know, move towards empiric public health strategies, because if our, if our default solution is like lockdowns every time, you know, my feeling is like, we all, some of us have young kids. It's like, it's going to be Mad Max out there. It's going to be like the Thunderdome in like 25 years. Do you know what I mean? As we repeat this cycle of, of three. So, I mean, I think there's a tremendous amount that we need to learn. I do want to make that point that like we have to get back to a point when public health can own. And, and by the way, Dr. Henry has done that, has, has managed the narrative in a powerful way and had credible death threats as a result of it, which is astounding, but nonetheless has been the case. Credible death threats, not like some random burner email account, credible death threats as a result of like not recommending or like not mandating masks and just working more on empowerment strategies or, or whatnot. And so, you know, I think there's, you know, we'll talk about specifics here. And I think we've tried, we've worked on being specific, but I, also the case of like, what is our framing for public health, you know, emergencies of international concern in the future? And I, and I worry that we've moved down a path that like, at some point we need to figure out and have a very open and honest discussion about it where we don't attack each other. And, and, and really reevaluate how we made decisions and, and think about how we're going to make these decisions moving forward. Because this is not our last dance. Yeah. It's just, just, just a fact. I'm a little anxious that we'll have a little bit of um, short-term memory loss or at that point, long-term memory loss. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. why. There's something, a spidey sense telling me that we're, we learn slow when it comes to this stuff. And m- maybe because of how we haven't learned much from the earlier in the pandemic. Okay. I, I'm gonna. I feel bad because there's a there was 73 questions here, and we're gonna try and do them as rapid fire as possible. Um, thanks, Julia, once again for uh, for screening these and throwing them down. So I'm gonna go quick. Uh, what are your feelings on PCR testing psych, uh, cycle threshold cycles in light of the new WHO guidance? What why is Canada doing them at such a high threshold? Uh, anybody, Zane? Yeah, I can, I can go ahead. So, you know, this has been a controversial issue. PCR looks for detectable viral DNA, and there is a level to it. But it also takes into account, as with every test, what a clinician thinks and the probabilities. And so if I am in the emergency room and I have a patient with fever, cough, and is about to go on a ventilator and has a positive test, I don't care what that test result is. It's a COVID case. Mm-hmm. If I'm walking on the street trying to swab people at a grocery store and looking at that test, then yes, I'm going to interpret that with a bit of caution. I look at the cycle threshold and that's part of my day-to-day job to say where in history did this occur? But it's not like every test is false and there's a narrative that's been put out there is because, you know, everyone is trying to interpret PCR, which is, you know, it took me, you know, a year of training to learn how PCR worked in clinical diagnostics in that sense. Um, you know, I, I, but at the same time, you know, it, it, not every PCR test is bad. It is the scenario you use them to how you interpret them. Mm-hmm. Thank you yeah. for that. Um, next question, I think, um, I'm not sure who the best person to answer this one, but well, I mean, I, I, I think it, this, it, there's, it, there's a question about, about testing asymptomatic folks. So, I mean, I'll, I'll say this because it actually builds on Zane's point that. One point to make for folks, which is a a core public health principle, by the way, is that like sensitivity and specificity is about the test itself, but positive predictive value, which is really about false positives, is really related to how prevalent something is. So, you know, when you have, so Zane was saying, like you have somebody where you have a high clinical suspicion, a lot of these tests are gonna work really great because the, the likelihood that they actually have it is high and your test kind of confirms it. When you're kind of doing these mass screenings of like everybody for, you know, for anything, the actual, like the positive predictive value of these tests goes down dramatically. And you end up with actual false positives, not because they don't have it, but because it's just a sort of a function of the way that these tests work because it was a low pretest probability. So while it sounds like a little public healthy, the, the reality is, I, you know, testing has, we've used testing very differently in the context of this response. I worry about how we've used testing. You know, I would have rather that we had set up some really meaningful guidelines around strategies for testing. And then more, and as importantly, that we linked each of those testing strategies to an actual intervention. So no 
I don't think that it makes a lot of sense. You know, I think that the, 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 the drama around asymptomatic transmission obviously has been fundamental because it's explained a lot of our restrictions. I will, you know, I'll say this, I guess, publicly or whatnot, is that I don't think that it's a huge part of the story. I, I think that a lot of it is actually, you know, symptomatic, very symptomatic transmission, but it's happening in places where, again, people just don't have the ability to isolate. So it's like, it's maybe less mysterious in that sense. But, um, and so, no, I, I don't think that we should be testing everybody. I think we should have a plan for everybody that we test, that we have a plan in order to really react to that. Because the thing that we learn in first day of medical school is like, don't test for something that you don't want to respond to. Don't just add something to the blood work because like, whatever, like mm -hmm. have a plan in place for it. And that applies, by the way, in public health too. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, just to give you a sense too, based on the nature of the test, if you're low, if you're like uh, in Ottawa, when our say in the in the summer where our prevalence was low, if you were to get uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, crew, but if you were to be uh, PCR positive, um, your false positive rate could be as high as fifty percent based on the low prevalence. Like it's it really yeah, is, yeah. Like it really and like this is like it's math. It's not. Um, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's not, um, subjective. Um, but anyway, we'll get to some more questions here. Some of the ones that Julia said, we're going to skip because uh, I think we touched a little bit on or won't hit too many people. This one, I think maybe a hideable one or everybody, what do you say to people like me, which I'm assuming is a young individual? Why do I need the vaccine? Uh, I'm young and odds are I'm not in danger due to COVID. Um, is that one fair? Is that Heidi? Is that fair? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to hop in on this and slightly hijack your question in two different directions. Uh, one is, I think one of the places where we saw a lot of this blame game, blah, 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 that we're talking about was young people, young people in the summer was right. Mm. <laughs> that was anyway, that was, that was a problem, you know? So it's not just that it's about racialized communities. It was also about generations. And I think the other thing where the messaging I think has been sort of strange is that we've ended up again in this world of, Either you get COVID um, and you're fine or you die. Um, but the truth is that we now know there's a huge spectrum in between. Um, and there are you know, trials and various other things that are following people with long COVID. Um, and that includes younger people. I think we'll get lots more data as we go along, but our messaging has not kept up with that in all sorts of ways that are actually very problematic, right? We need to explain, uh, we don't know everything about this, um, but there are a wide variety of outcomes that are potential here that are not just recovered death. Um, and I think that's been actually a, one of the major issues that we haven't evolved with the evidence, right? It's another one of those examples. Um, and one more is, you know, the obsession with surfaces rather than shared air. Um, but one, I think really for young people is you can have effects of COVID that are lingering, um, even if they aren't, you know, the, the death variety of things. And we need to get a better message out there. And that's one of many reasons. And the other with vaccines is obviously this question of herd immunity. Um, how do you really get to herd immunity? It's through vaccine. So I think this is a great way of it. Let's, let's be proactive about this. Let's explain to different groups of people, meet them where they're at. Okay. If I'm a young person, why do I want to get this? Why is it good for, why is it good for me? And why is it good for my community and my society? Beautiful. Yeah. And can I just say, I mean, part of this has been like, there's been some really problematic messaging in North America in general about vaccines, like, and, and it really relates to the transmission issue. Right, that the idea that a vaccine doesn't just protect you, but likely decreases transmission. And what's interesting is that the messaging in Europe has been very much like, you know, kids taking their masks off, adults taking their masks off, people hugging each other. Like that's the messaging. And obviously that's, you know, the, the idea being that it doesn't just protect you, that there's some onward transmission decrease as a result of that. Our messaging has been exactly as I think a young person is saying like, well, if, if it doesn't decrease transmission, why would I bother? And it's actually like a more complicated discussion to have with them, unless it actually does protect folks down the line, which by the way, I believe it does. So I think, you know, we need to be, we need to be cognizant that like once people are vaccinated, it's, it's also about them being able to change their behaviors. Because whether we like it or not, I always say this, that like, you know, a pragmatic public health approach for harm reduction isn't that you like love everything, all the choices that people make. It's just that you're pragmatic about the choices that people are going to make so that you're in a better position to kind of like discuss them and message around them. So I, I do think that like, you know, part of this is the case that, you know, when you're saying this, it's about life normalizing in the context of vaccines. And if we can't effectively make that case, I actually think as somebody who's been vaccinating people old and young, 
it, it's going to be a, a much harder and more uphill battle if we don't give some idea that like this is about life and normalcy, um, you know, in the context of vaccination. Love it. Love it. Um, all right. Should we be closing our borders? Should I answer this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So again, this goes back to sustainability, right? So we have evidence now. My so McMaster University, my colleagues have actually studied what happens in terms of transmission, in terms of COVID positivity of travelers. One percent of people on a plane have COVID when they show up to Pearson or they show up to one of the other airports in the country from an international destination. Seventy percent of those people are diagnosable the moment they land with COVID-19. And so, and then, you know, if you, if you follow them along with time, the vast majority of them you pick up by day seven. So rather than closing the border, this goes back to sustainability. Why haven't we built a better border process? We are seeing variants circulating in Canada, which means our 14 day of quarantine is clearly not working. People are interacting. Quarant you know, 14 days of quarantine is hard even for me even for us that like have the privilege of like having a home and a place to get food and groceries delivered and all that stuff. I can't imagine it's easy for a trucker coming back from the United States or, you know, as someone that lives in a multi-generational family. But why aren't we using what we have or technologies to make travel safe, build it into the cost of travel for those travelers coming back again with variants and everything moving forward, expecting the borders to close forever and ever and ever. And that's going to protect us for all, all time, knowing that we have the largest land border with the, you know, our, our biggest trading partner in the world, you know, that there's, there's a problem there. But if you said to people, listen, you come into Canada, you do a rapid test right at your point of entry at the border, at the airport. If you're positive, we isolate you. We give you the supports again. That eliminates that variant from coming into Canada because now you figured it out. You put them in isolation for the other 99 people on the flight. You test them again at day seven and you figure out, okay, that person is, is clear. And then you release them at day seven. And the evidence suggests you will pick up the vast majority of cases that way. But also you get people that can complete a day seven quarantine appropriately. It's a yes. whole lot easier to isolate for seven days versus 14 days. But the game, the, the mentality is, no, we can't do this. Stop, right? Like we can't travel. We need to close the borders. Variants are coming. Close it, close it, close it. That's it. But the reality is, is we can deal with this with travel testing. There are places that, that are doing this. And so why aren't we incorporating technology into making it safe and sustainable? Because when people get vaccinated, the first thing they're going to do is go to travel and see their relatives. And we need a plan to do that, right? Once again, anticipating the, anticipating the, what's, uh, what's happening moving forward. Um, we kind of, this might be a tough one, but what do you think of mandatory vaccine passports for entering business, travel, entertainment, all that kind of stuff? Any takers? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I'll take it. Uh, I don't believe in mandating vaccines. Um, I think it brings us down. You know, I, I, I'm not like some, you know, kind of freedom, whatever. But I, I, I just think that like, we are able to get the vaccine coverage that we need using a variety of different approaches of like empowerment, education, engagement, and, and facilitating folks getting access to vaccines rather than this idea of like the mandating vaccines and, and that that being some sort of passport. But there's a number of reasons why. One is that we already have enough challenges for like, there's, there's not gonna be equal access to this vaccine. We're gonna have large swaths of the world that it could take years for folks to get access to a solid vaccine. And we're gonna be creating, a, like, are we allowed to travel there? And they're not allowed to travel to us because we like kind of have, like there's, there's so many issues and challenges with that vaccine. It also provides this false sense of security because not all folks are protected with the vaccine. So I think there's this element of like, at some point in the next year, we're gonna move, like we say this, like the definition of an epidemic is more cases than you expect. And at some point, we're going to have to like a lot realign our expectations of transmission with, you know, some real some reality. And then we'll have to decide, you know, whether there's an actual outbreak or an epidemic still happening. So I don't believe in mandating vaccines. I think we can totally achieve it without mandates. But I, I'm in general against public health mandates. I, I want I want to take this this piece about Great Barrington and COVID deniers very briefly, because it's it's you know what I said earlier was 
there are folks across a whole spectrum of this. That, and it's like COVID zero to COVID deniers along the way. Um, the Great Barrington Declaration, the starting point was actually concerns about lockdowns, but the answer often was just like, let society move forward with, you know, some focused support. I think many of us don't, you know, have very specific ideas. None of the uh, things that we've talked about today are reflected in that. So paid leave, um, you know, housing support, the sorts of things that I, I think many of us feel like are very empirically responsive to the data that we've seen are reflected in that. But I think their starting point about being gravely concerned about seeing folks in, you know, on the margins be pushed further on the margins is not unreasonable. And I didn't, I think it's important to say, I don't think that they're COVID deniers. I just don't happen to agree with what they consider to be the approach forward. But I was really like listing, like there are COVID deniers and then there's the sort of a whole range of folks along, along that way. Often it's used to like say, well, you, you don't, you know, if you don't believe in, co you know, COVID nothing, then you know you're then you're a great Barrington, and it's used to sort of devalue and ultimately just devalues the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's used as a way of of you know kind of creating this dynamic where you're afraid to talk about these things. And and I think that isn't harm. That's just harmful to to meaningful engagement. It is harmful for sure. Um, I'm going to try and I, I promise to. Uh, a panelist would be about until 8.30. So I'm going to try and hammer out a couple more guys. I apologize if we didn't get to as many, but um, if there are some questions, throw them down on social media. Every single person here is very active on their social media site, specifically Twitter. Um, so we'll do our best. Um, thoughts on the new variant. Should this aff uh, affect anything uh, on how we behave or what we do? Um, I think Zane? I think Stefan gave this point a long time ago in one, one of our conversations. And you know what happens in the community happens in the community. We have this dialogue about reducing community transmission protects the vulnerable sector, but in reality, that's not completely true. Uh, and and you know the the big risk of this variant is if it gets into the wrong places where where you know you see epidemic spread and you see localized you know epidemics. So there's some suspect, I guess, in Roberta Place in Barrie that that might be driving some of it. The the major change with this variant is again we have to look at protecting vulnerable sectors against the variant. Right? You know the average person may get disease you know, it, their, their outcomes are going to be similar. But as we see more and more and more transmission, the people that are going to get hit the hardest are the same people that got hit the hardest today, that got hit the hardest a month ago, that got hit the hardest six months ago. We still are not testing and protecting long-term care as we should adequately. There are people on the margins working in long-term care that can't afford to, to stay home sick uh, and go to work sick and lead to explosive outbreaks. There are shelters and marginally housed individuals that don't access have access to stable uh, housing that are you know that are in correctional facilities where they are put at major risk of acquiring COVID nineteen. And so you know I, I think the big thing going forward is that yes the same things we're doing in public health work you know in terms of masking distancing all that stuff. But this is even more emphasis that those settings are going to get hit the hardest. And you know what we've been doing for long-term care right now has still not been adequate. We're 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 slow on vaccinations. We still have transient staff. Our testing isn't up to see. We're finally talking about putting rapid testing up and available for people coming in. You know they're going to get hit hard if this gets in, and it's echoes from the first wave. It's echoes from the first transmissions that happened in community in Canada. You remember it happened in Seattle. It happened in Vancouver. That the first community cases ended up getting into care facilities. And we're talking about the same thing again, not learning the difference other than, yeah, we can use masks to help prevent patients, but that's not the end solution in that sense. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, I think, yeah, I think it, it's, it's eight 30. I apologize for those that uh, we didn't get to their questions. Um, as I mentioned, we, uh, this was an, a bit, uh, um, a daunting endeavor where we wanted to try and really come up with ways that we can move forward. And I, I really want to thank Heidi, Zane, Steph. This was amazing. Like, I think for one of the things, the gifts of this platform is some of these details are hard to 
really bust out in a 48 second sound bit, uh, sound bite on CBC, you know, that long form where you get to really show why paid leave matters. You get to show how that example of rapid testing, you get to show that example of why um, being able to have uh, an isolation shelter is so important. You know what I mean? And so that gift of you guys throwing down and be able to really uh, express how important these things are. I hope it's not going under deaf ears. Okay. And this was inspired by one of the journalists that like Steph and I actually, we talked about this before, about, like a month and a half ago, I want to say about trying to do this. And, you know, I see you life gets a little bit hectic. And then a, a journalist asked, actually commented to me and said, like, you know, if you guys come up with something like this, we'll, we'll get, we'll get the exposure. We'll get it out there. So it is now out there guys. And I want you guys to tell your friends, we're going to have this on a black uh, podcast format. We'll have uh, Julia. God bless you. Have, um, um, sound bites that we could put out on social media as well but this is going to get out there real like concrete examples of what we could do for moving forward and they're realistic these aren't pipe dreams and a lot of them are simple concepts yo and they've been done before and this is, and we don't need to recreate the wheel okay so thank you I hope you feel inspired I hope you feel like yes people this is what we need to do and um Podcast Nation, I, I love you and uh, thanks for tuning in, guys.